Head injuries are some of the trickiest patients that we'll ever have to deal with as EMS providers. This is going to be part two, talking about the circulation and managing the mean arterial pressure as well as the cerebral perfusion pressures. If you haven't seen part one, check out the airway and breathing module part of this before you check this one out and everything will make much more sense. Let's get into it. Have some fun. Okay, so we talked about the airway and breathing, and we know that the more hypoxia we have in those patients, the more dangerous the higher mortality continues to rise on those particular patients. So airway and breathing is a very, very important part of this puzzle, but another equally important part is the circulation, which is what we're going to be covering right now. Okay, so we've already talked about the airway and breathing and how important that is. Now we need to talk about the circulation because even though we saw that hypoxia can double mortality rates, so can hypotension. And so let's talk about that. And so our normal mean arterial pressures, our MAPs, typically sit at around 65. That's what you essentially need in order to maintain proper consistent flow and perfusion to end organs. Now in a head injury patient, typically you're going to see that mean arterial pressure target or goal is to be anywhere between above 80 to 85. So much higher. And let's explain why that is. Okay. So we have a mean arterial pressure here. That's flow that's coming this way. Okay. Towards the brain. That's your map. Okay, then you have your ICP or your intracranial pressures. Your intracranial pressures are essentially the pressure that's pushing back here, okay? Pushing back on this mean arterial pressure trying to go here into the brain itself. That's your ICP. Then you have your cerebral perfusion pressure. That's essentially the perfusion pressure that's inside the brain itself and allows for constant perfusion. Now, normal perfusions, we'd like to keep around 55 to 60. And that's important to know because anything below 55 meaning, means that our brain, our cerebrum, is not getting enough enough perfusion in order to maintain its main functions. And the brain doesn't hold stores, it doesn't maintain a whole lot of storage of nutrients. And so if we have even small amounts of decreases or even short durations of decreases of perfusion pressures in the brain, we actually are going to have a lot of problems with this patient. They're going to go into having anoxic brain injuries, they're going to have more uh, ischemia, infarction within the brain because of these main decreases of the cerebral perfusion pressure. Okay, and so our map, like we said, we typically keep it around 65. And now in our normal ICP, we and that's that pressure again pushing back this way, is anywhere between 5 to 15 as normal. Okay, 5 to 15 pushing back and mean arterial pressure pushing forward into the brain. And that's how we maintain this cerebral perfusion pressure. So why is this mean arterial pressure goal so much higher? Well, what happens in a head injury patient, we typically see this ICP go much higher. Okay, and so just to give a reference, any between 20 and 30 uh, millimeters of mercury is considered at least a mild to moderate head injury patient or cerebrum hypertension, which means that we need to actually compensate for something like this, which is why you typically see hypertension early in these patients and see the mean arterial pressure go up a little bit to compensate. Because if we have this ICP going up, this pressure pushing back on this mean arterial pressure trying to push forward to the brain, that means our cerebral perfusion pressure is going to go down. Okay, in order to compensate for that, our body says, hey, we need more pressure going forward. We're not getting enough perfusion in the brain. So it tries to increase our mean arterial pressure to compensate. Okay, so that's why we try and maintain or try and I, I maintain a mean arterial pressure of 80 to 85 to compensate for this drastic increase in ICP that's ultimately going to drive the CPP down. Now, a lot of these head injury patients are going to be found with hypertension, but not all of them. And in fact, actually, only a certain amount of them truly are going to have real hypertension because all it is is simply a compensation 
of the fact that we have massive increases in ICP and decreases in CPP. So this number typically goes up in the early stages of a head injury, but it doesn't always stay there. Remember the brain needs to maintain, the body needs to maintain this for as long as it can, but unfortunately it will decompensate and we'll see these patients get worse and worse and worse and start to see their mean arterial pressures start to drop. In fact, any um, drops below, even the smallest amount of time drops below 85 mean arterial pressure pressure actually doubles the mortality rate of these particular patients. And that's really drawing back to this being a very important goal to maintain or else we're causing a problem with our patients long term and ultimately increasing the mortality rate. So we need to be very diligent, just like we saw with hypoxia, maintaining a no dips in hypox or in saturations whatsoever, it's equally as important to make sure that we maintain mean arterial pressures high enough too so that we don't increase that mortality rate. So two really big things that we need to watch out for. So now that we understand CP, uh, CPP, ICP, and mean arterial pressures and how they correlate with each other and why it's so important to make sure that we maintain higher MAPs in these patients, let's talk about how we can. So we've already talked about how our goal Okay, our goal is to maintain a mean arterial or a, a mean arterial pressure of 80 to 85. It's going to depend on the literature you read. It's going to depend on the protocols that you're going to see out there. But most of them are going to be in this range to be aggressive in maintaining these patients. Okay, now how are we going to do that? Well, we have a few choices in order to maintain a mean arterial pressure of 80 to 85. Okay, and in order to ultimately keep the cerebral perfusion pressure from going below 55, we wanna make sure that, so that way we have consistent flow of blood and flow of perfusion to the brain by maintaining at least a CPP of 55. So we're gonna do it with three different things here. First off, fluids. Now typically your fluid challenges are gonna be the, around 500 mils in the fluid challenge basis here. And so a lot of people are going, hey, isn't it important to make sure that we don't irritate any cerebral, uh, um, a cerebral tissues and those kind of things with our saline, is it actually that safe? It is safer than hypotension, is essentially kind of the, the leading uh, consensus is that yes, it may cause some issues, uh, but not nearly as much as what hypotension will do. And so for temporizing measures in order to maintain our mean arterial pressure between uh, above 80 to 85, then we wanna make sure that we are giving that fluid in order to temporize that blood pressure, because again, any drops below 80 to 85, we're doubling the mortality rate, which is a little more dangerous than fluids and our concerns for irritating, irritating cerebral tissues, okay? So that's the first off, is fluids. And that's going to help increase our MAP, okay? It's going to increase our mean arterial pressure in order to hopefully uh, compensate for the amount of massive increases in intracranial pressure. The second thing we're gonna do is look at something like a hypertonic, something like mannitol, or what's commonly being used now is 3% hypertonic saline. Now this is going to not really improve on the map, but what it's going to do is it's going to take all this excess fluid that's around the brain, and that all that fluid, remember, is your ICP. Okay, is your ICP. And so what we're going to do is we're going to increase the tenacity of our blood. And what that's ultimately, ultimately going to do is it's gonna take this fluid that's no longer useful within the brain because now it's causing a lot of ICP, is that we're going to draw that fluid back into the vessels in order to be put back into circulation and basically be pulled out of the brain. And so instead of maintaining or increasing the map like we did with fluids, what hypertonic saline is going to do is it's essentially going to decrease our ICP by again achieving a better CPP. So that's the second thing what we're going to do. Again, it's going to decrease our ICP by drawing fluids out of this area and bring it back into circulation to be basically brought out of the brain and back into areas that are not under pressure. And that's essentially what we're doing there. Now, norepinephrine is our kind of big gun that we might need. If we can't maintain our mean arterial pressure of 80 to 85 by using something like fluids in order to maintain that, or let's say you have to intubate this patient, you're ventilating them, you're using drugs in order to keep sedation, using ketamine, whatever the case may be, maybe you went with a different drug that has a little bit more vasoactiveness to it, 
then we can use norepinephrine in order to compensate for that vasodilatory effect of some of those drugs if you have to use them. And so using norepinephrine in order to, again, maintain that MAP as high as we can above 80 in order to maintain cerebral perfusion pressures to a normal and safe area, then that's something that you may have to look at if you, again, are seeing hypotension refractory to any type of fluid use that you're trying to use in order to compensate uh, for those drops in mean arterial pressure. Okay, so that's our part two installment of managing a patient in a traumatic brain injury. Make sure you check out the GEMS article here. It has a lot of stuff that's really outlining all the very important things that we're going through these videos and outlines them point by point, as well as the cited sources they use in order to maintain the authenticity of these classes and of these videos. So make sure you check those out as well. So we've done part two, which was the circulation. We've done part one, which was the airway and breathing, both very important pieces to this puzzle. Now we're going to go into part three which is going to be talking about the head injury patients and using TXA in order to benefit these patients so check that one out next Monday that's coming out when Kevin's going to do that one with you guys and we're going to have some fun on that one and really start to really well round out these patients so that way you can better maintain these patients better manage these patients in traumatic brain injuries so that way we can have give them the best possible outcomes we'll see you next week